Thanks, everybody, for coming to the iBeacon session, uh, iBeacon Education. Uh, I'm Tim Perfit with Two Canoes Software. Um, I, uh, I know you've been through one and a half, maybe two and a half days of slides, so I'm going to try something different. I'm not going to do any slides today. It's going to be all demos. I'm going to take the stuff that I'm going to talk about, that are normally kind of the background in technology, and do it in kind of demo form and kind of walk you through it. I want it to be a little bit interactive, so I might ask some people to help me out. Beacons involve movement and moving away from things and towards things, and they tethered me with this phone, so I can't move very far. So um, uh, I'd like to help uh, people walking around beacons, if that'd be nice. Um, I got a couple of iBeacons up here, um, mainly three of them that we'll be using to show different aspects of them. We'll go over the technology, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how, how, the, how Bluetooth and the technology works, and we'll go into um, how, how Apple kind of innovated on using Bluetooth to be able to help solve some problems. And then we'll give some, uh, some real-world examples, and, then, and finally we'll talk about how those things can specifically fit into education. We haven't seen any really wide-scale education deployments of beacons yet. In fact, we've only started to see wide-scale wide -scale deployments of beacons um, in the last couple of months. So this is really a, a brand new field. So let's talk about why iBeacon kind of came up in the first place. I mean, how many people have played around with iBeacon? How many people have actually triggered and done something with iBeacon? OK, decent number of folks. Um, so the motivation that came up from it was, a lot of times I talk to people like, why iBeacon? is we have GPS, right? I say, iBeacon helps your phone know where it's at. And I'm like, well, that's already done, right? I can open up the map and it can tell me exactly where I'm at. And the problem that it solved, and this is kind of illustrated by, we, we created an app called GeoHopper that allows you to find, <coughs> put geofences around your house or your work and enter an exit. And we had customers and people in education come to us and say, you know what I want to do? I want to do like a gallery, right? When I go from one sign to the, or one, um, um, picture or modern art or whatever to another thing and be able to detect that it moved from here to here. And the great example I had is when you do the Alcatraz tour, right? It'd be great if to walk around and have proximity know that. And Alcatraz is a great example of why it would really be hard for GPS, right? Because you're inside of its stone and minerals and it's hard to get, you need line of sight for GPS and you're walking around a lot. And GPS has problems with two of those things. One is that you got to have line of sight so it doesn't work well if indoors, especially if you're deep indoor or something. And the second one is it takes a long time to be able to resolve three uh, satellites. Anybody have one of the old Magellans that they put in their cars that they turn on? It would take, it would take about 30 <coughs> seconds to a minute to start up, but if you flew across the country and turned it on, it would take about eight minutes. So you'd have to sit in the car and just kind of stare at your GPS for a while. Apple solved that problem with, and a lot of the other map makers did, or smartphone device makers, um, by using Wi-Fi and referencing some common locations to kind of figure out where it's at. And that's why that circle starts big and goes smaller, because while it's looking for satellites, it, try, it tries to guess where you're at. So core location in iOS does a great job of figuring that out. But if it can, if it can never get to the satellites, if it can never get um, uh, to be able to figure out what those signals are, it'll never know where you're at. And the other problem is when you're moving, being able to track that and figure it out very granular and very quickly, it's, it's hard to do. So that goes back to that whole problem of Alcatraz. I'm going to do my ultimate Alcatraz walking tour, or my ultimate campus tour, is just to put on my headphones, walk around campus, walk around Alcatraz, and have the, my tour be customized based on the area that I'm at, right? And not have to listen to content that I don't necessarily want to have. So yeah, I apologize. I don't, is there a way to turn off just text messages without disabling everything else? What's that? Will that turn off? They'll turn off all my beacon notifications, though. Oh, yeah. OK. What's that? Settings. Oh, you can actually do it by notification center? Oh, and then I can just go into phone? Oh, messages. Oh, there we go. Oh, not here. First one. There we go. OK. My niece had uh, ear surgery, in case you guys didn't already know. <laughs> <laughs> She, I don't think it's anything any of us would be embarrassed about if she knew that it, you know, she's 19, if she knew that I'd be talking, if she knew I was talking about her right now, she'd be really embarrassed. Okay. So. She's fine. She has, she has a note that she has to give the TSA whenever she goes through board flights now because uh, she has a little metal tube in her ear. It was kind of funny. Um, I think I was talking about beacons. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> location services. Location services, okay. 
Still no idea. Okay, move on. The, um, so GPS came, so beacons allow you to have this fine granular control. I know us. I was talking about the walking tour, be able to walk around and know exactly where you're at. And so we had people asking us, how do we do these like close locations to micro locations? And, um, and there's a lot of discussion about payments and those kind of things. Other like Android devices and, and other devices use NFC to be able to do it. There's RFID. A lot of these other technologies tried to solve the problem. And Apple went to Bluetooth, which at the time was a little bit crazy because people thought of Bluetooth as kind of your grandfather's protocol for talking devices. And Bluetooth was, um, uh, was developed originally to get rid of all your wires to hook up to your CPU, your computer, right? Your speaker wires, your mouse wires, all that kind of stuff. And then you have headsets that did high streaming, that kind of stuff. And so the Bluetooth um, special interest group says we need something for mobile. And the problem with mobile isn't connecting all these devices up with wires, right? It's to be able to wirelessly connect up to these kind of sensors that go on around it, something a little bit more lightweight. So they came up with a new standard um, called many different things. Anybody? There's three, at least three different names for the Bluetooth 4.0. Anybody know what they are? Bluetooth LE. Bluetooth LE, that's one of them. Another one? Bluetooth Smart, because Bluetooth LE wasn't enough. So LE stands for low energy, and the idea is that it's uh, very short packets, works the same bandwidth as, uh, or same spectrum as Wi-Fi, very short, very uh, energy efficient. The idea is that when they designed it, they wanted it to be able to, a, a BLE device, oh, that's the, the, the third name, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, um, is be able to um, run on a coin cell battery for up to a year. Okay, not all devices can do that, but they're saying that if you had a device that was running in low energy mode, you'd go up for a year with just a coin cell battery, and uh, so it had to be very low energy. So Apple adopted this technology; has been building Bluetooth into their hardware, and they they said, well, if we can just know where things are relative to where the phone is, we can have an an, an idea of where the proximity to where this is, and we would be able to we would be able to use the technology that's built into the phone right now. So. Um, before we get started, let me, so let's actually go in. I want everyone to do this because people, you, you technical people like to manage your Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth, your notification centers. If you just leave your phones alone, things would be a lot easier. But uh, your battery wouldn't be as good, but it would be a lot easier for me. Um, but for these demos, I want to get people to actually uh, see some of this stuff. So if you turn on, make sure that Bluetooth is, Bluetooth is turned on. And you can do that from the drawer or whatever the thing is that comes up from the bottom. I heard this called the junk drawer, which I thought was great. Like everything that's kind of just piled in there. Um, and the, the important one is you get prompted uh, whenever you do like a passbook pass or something like that or a location services app. If you go into notification, uh, sorry, go into general, uh, oh, sorry, privacy, it's always hidden, privacy, location services. And make sure location services is on and make sure you turn on the one for passbook. And then all of my demos should work swimmingly. All right, and if you don't want to turn that on because you're going to believe it's going to kill your battery, which it shouldn't and normally doesn't, um, but me telling you that will not convince you, so it won't matter. So I, when I, whenever people come to work, when it comes to the uh, office of two canoes that have come from more of a PC background or just maybe use a different cell phone or whatever, there's like this re- um, reprogramming process, I like to call it, I guess. One is that you don't have to shut down your computer every night. That's a great one. I go to people, it's like, stop shutting down your computer. And the second one is you don't have to turn Wi-Fi on and off as you go to different places. Um, but that's, that's a personal thing. Um, so now that Bluetooth is on, let's talk a little bit about uh, Bluetooth LE. So I have these beacons. So beacon, beacons come in all different shapes and sizes. We have uh, these USB-powered ones. Uh, they just plug in any, any kind of power brick and start broadcasting. There's many different forms to this. There's three major manufacturers of the chipsets for beacons. One's TI, the other one's Nordic Semiconductor, and the third one is uh, Qualcomm. So those are the three major manufacturers. These are based on the TI chipset. doesn't really matter. Bluetooth is pretty common across the board. If you want to know if Bluetooth works, Bluetooth low energy works with something, you've got to make sure it has Bluetooth 4.0, which is any newish Mac or iOS device. Um, so let's plug one of these in. I got this huge power brick that I have from last year. Makes for a great beacon powering device. 
And uh, I'll go into, there's a great app that's for just a couple dollars in the store called, uh, not ours, called BLE Explorer. And what this does is allows you to find out any Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth 4.0 devices in the room. Let's find out if anybody's wearing one of their, a Pebble watch, a Nike band, anything like that. So these will all show up and I'll be able to find out what your heart rate is. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but what it will do is that, uh, this just goes to show you that, so this, I'm seeing this one that ends in 4F is our beacon here, and I can connect up to it, and it has a bunch of hex codes, right? These are all just, um, I'm not going to go through and read all these hex codes to you, even though I want to. Uh, but what the point is that it's just a normal BLE device. I can connect up to it and see it just like I can see anything that's BLE 4.0. So there's nothing special about a iBeacon. It's, it's a Bluetooth smart device that's broadcasting in the specific way that Apple um, says to broadcast, right? It has the it identifiers. We'll talk about that in a second. So just like I can browse any of the other Bluetooth 4.0 devices, I can see the, the beacons. This utility is great for finding random, random devices on the network or if opening up at conferences that have a lot of Bluetooth devices. I was at Macworld or at uh, there's a, um, NRF, yeah, NRF at the beginning of the year. There was hundreds if not thousands of Bluetooth devices in one small area. And it, you can actually find out how much the developers tested something when you open in one of those areas because it doesn't usually handle those things kind of well. But this app works pretty well. Um, so let's actually go in and look what this, this, um, this device I have. This is the one, it's identified by uh, 4F as the last four digits. So we'll go into a utility we have and I'll show you the settings that are on these. You don't have to watch the characters, the password is password. I'm gonna change that right after this session. Okay, and so this is, um, you can see these are the major pieces um, to our, uh, uh, to a beacon. So the, the three major ones are, are uh, UUID, so this is a universal, uh, oh my gosh, universal identifier? Unique. Unique identifier, thank you, wow. Can't believe I forgot that, so UUID. And the nice thing about that is that you can generate them on your own. You do not need to go to a central registry and get them. You can generate a UUID, and the chances are, it's, it's crazy uh, <laughs> unlikely that you'd ever have a conflict. It's like if you ran once a second for 10,000 years or something like that, you wouldn't have a conflict. So you can generate these on your own, and Apple recommends that you have these UUIDs, one for your organization. So you have one for your organization, Penn State would have one UUID. You can go to, go to your Mac and uh, uh, go to open up terminal and type UUID gen, and you have your very own 32-bit or 120-bit, very long number that is uh, your UUID. I think it's 32 bytes, 128-bit, is that right? 120, thank you. Two to the power of N. Um, and it also has major and minor numbers associated with it. So those are the three things that kind of d identify what a beacon is. So beacon sits here and it broadcasts out a UUID and a major and a minor number. And there's a couple of important pieces to that. One of them is that one is you can, you can create the, your own UUIDs and major and minor numbers, not worry about somebody else conflicting with what you did. And it also, it just broadcasts this information out. In fact, it does it 10 times a second. And it broadcasts out about 150 feet, and we'll do a little measurement on this one, very one, to kind of show that. Um, and you can, uh, and the iOS device can look at that and get triggered by those, uh, the signals coming from it. And the, the key thing about that is that the iOS device, there's no um, kind of secret sauce associated with it. There's no built-in content capturing. Like one of the things I get all the time is, how do I put content on the beacon to automatically push an app or a coupon or camp campus tour information or gallery information in the beacon so I can push it onto the app, onto the phone? Right? And that's, that's, not, that's not what a beacon does. A beacon just sends out those three identifiers, UUID, major, minor number. And the app itself is, does something interesting with it. So right here you can see my UUID is E2, blah, 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 and major number is one and minor number is two. That means that's Dean's, what is this room? <coughs> Dean's conference room two or Dean's room one? Sorry. Is what? Dean's hall one. So this is now defines Dean's hall one. In fact, maybe we can say the major number, this is uh, the UUID is Penn State. 
Uh, major number is the Penn Stater, which is number one, because the Penn Stater's number one. And minor number number two would be Dean's Hall number one, because it wouldn't that be confusing. And we'll label Dean's Hall number two minor number one, right? Because then people would never ever be able to figure it out. It's like naming printers, how to mess with people. Uh, but that's all hidden from the people using it. And so one of the key pieces that if the content doesn't exist on these, the app would see those numbers and do something interesting with it. They would know that it's in Dean's Hall 1. It wouldn't know, it wouldn't connect up to this beacon and say, oh, give me some slides, right? All it would do is say, oh, I'm in Dean's Hall 1, let me go download some slides in the app. So that's one of the key things with, with, uh, with beacons. And there's no, there's no back end, it doesn't report back to the back end, there's no Wi-Fi that goes reports, it doesn't say, oh, Mike's, Mike just entered uh, Dean's Hall 1, I'm gonna report to the NSA that he's in the room, right? Your app will do that. You don't need the beacon <laughs> to do that. Not your app, somebody else's app will do that. Okay, so that's, um, so that's kind of what the, the major one, so there's no um, content involved in it, and one of the interesting things I've for, with Bluetooth Low Energy is that the reason that these, these devices broadcast out is it's saying it has a service. It's saying I have, and this is aside from iBeacon, if you have a, a Nike uh, Bluetooth smart uh, fitness band, yeah, fuel band, or Pebble or something like that, it'll advertise out. In fact, your iPhone does. It says I have a service. You can connect up to me and find out something. Then you open up the Nike, uh, I'm sorry, what was it Nike? Fuel Band, Nike Fuel Band app, and it'll connect up to it and read your heart rate and all that kind of stuff. Apple did something interesting. They took the second part away. They just advertise. They say, hey, we have a service, but the service information is UUID major and minor number. So the devices never have to connect up to it, which is kind of cool because now your device listens passively. It doesn't broadcast out. It doesn't have to connect up to it. You can't sniff MAC addresses. You can't you can't know when somebody's connecting. All they're doing is they walk into this hall and it's passively listening for Bluetooth signals and it can know that it's in Dean's Hall 1 based on these identifiers. And so that's very different from the way that, and it's very different with the way Bluetooth LE was designed, which is that you advertise a service, you connect up to it and get information. It gets the information just from the broadcast packet. So when people talk about how Bluetooth can enable, can enable people to track you, it's really about the app knows where it's at and it could report back just in, by inherently with having these beacons, doesn't spill any extra information into the environment to be picked up. Which is very different from what? What are we all bleeding out right now from our phones? Battery. Oh, battery, we're dying, battery's dying. But you know how retailers are always, always tracking you and they know if you come back again to their stores? Mac, address. Mac addresses, right? So your Wi-Fi, if you're not connected up to a access point, it's looking for access point, most likely, and it's broadcasting your MAC address. And one of the nice things about iOS 8, I don't know if you've seen the, the things that it randomizes that, when it's asking for Wi-Fi networks, it'll randomize that MAC address. and only give away your real one when you connect up. And that means, and this is complete aside, but what that means is that every place you know that wants to do analytics is now gonna start offering free Wi-Fi. Because they want you to connect up. Which for me is actually a good trade-off. Right, so they give me something, and I give them information to give the NSA. All works out. All right, so that's so those are the main three identifiers. So let's do something fun with it. Uh, all right, I was going to do oh distance. So um, all this stuff is usually hidden from people doing it. It's all part of the infrastructure, but it's kind of important to understand Bluetooth before we talk about applying it. Um, let's be. This, the Apple has a sample app called AirLocate, and we go to ranging. All right, so this is a ranging app, and you notice that it has, um, oh, actually, no, let me, let me go back. This is, this is even more fun. Go back to BL Explorer. We'll connect up to this peripheral, and you can see that this number up here is an RSSI value, and it's measured in dB, because who wouldn't want to know their distance in RF dB numbers? Um, so you can see this number is pretty steady because the phone's right next to the beacon. Right? That's not normally how it is. So what happens is the way that the phone knows how far it is away from the beacon is based on the signal strength. Right? And so it's really stable. If you move it real close, it's negative 37. It's dB, so it means that uh, it, it's, it's more negative than you would want. You move it away, you can see that it goes up higher. 
and you'll go up to like not one, minus 92 before that. So you can see that as the numbers get higher, the signal gets smaller. So what we can do is, if I can put my body in front of it, you can see what happens is I can make it even go worse. I put it behind my back, negative 76, right? So what's happening is this signal is getting attenuated based on, on big bags of water, which are people, right? This is like, why is Tim talking about this? He likes talking about electrical things. This has a real impact in when you deploy beacon stuff, right? So if you have a painting on the wall and you want to go and you want to have uh, to talk about information about it, you say, you know what, I'm really, a, I'm a cheap guy. I only want to buy one beacon. I'm going to put it right between two paintings and I'm going to figure out where the person is. And I go and I calibrate it because I like to do measurements, right? And it all works perfectly. And then you open up the gallery and what happens? 10 people come in, right? And they stand around it, and all your measurements are all completely off. So anything that gets between you and the beacon causes problems. The way to solve that is you can move the beacons up above you, or you can use multiple beacons, those kind of things. But be aware that finding out distances is really difficult based on signal uh, intensity. right? And, so, and the other thing that people like to do is put their phones in their pocket. right? And that's a great way to put a little bit more and turn around, put their body between them and the beacon. And we'll see uh, an example of that. If we go into air locate, you can see that this actually calibrates it. So it's supposed to be, that's about, is that about a meter? Is that a meter? That's about a meter. Is it the same meter? It's pretty close to a meter. All right, so what happens if I don't do anything else and I put my hands here? All right, a meter and a quarter. I turn the phone sideways. Oh, it's three quarters of a meter. It's half a meter. Right, just by turning the phone in a different direction. All right, so it makes a big difference just the orientation of the phone and what's between you and it. So let's find out distances. So I said this goes about 150 feet, which is how many, how many meters? 33, okay, so why don't you take this and start walking that way until we lose signal. You're, you're on the end, you gotta do it. I do it, except I can't. I'm tethered here. So go slowly. Go slowly so we watch. Be dramatic. Make some dramatic noises as you go. <laughs> That's a long time ago, so we wouldn't know. Okay, just stay there, and it'll catch up. Wow, four meters, how far do you think he is? Is that about 10 meters away? I am horrible at matters to me. Is there any Canadians in the room? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta go until it goes out. So you, if you can just go out the door and keep going and see how far I get. And it'll go away. It'll say far will turn to unknown. Is that door open? Keep going, keep going. It says do not enter. Keep going. There, no, it's impossible. There's no conversion. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> you just you multiply by three, right? He's not, well, get, keep going, keep going, walk down the hall. It's a good one. So go this way. Go this way. I want to see it disappear. No, don't unplug it. That's very undramatic. <laughs> oh, okay, that'll do it too. If you have a Faraday cage, then we just put it in the Faraday cage. You'll be all set. All right, so you can see how fast it's updating. It's updating relatively quickly, but it's not updating instantaneously. So if you're doing a walking tour or galleries, those kind of things, you need it. Okay, see, it just went to all known. Okay, it went away. It's raining, too. I didn't know that. There, see, now it disappeared. Now we'll know when he comes back. So everybody hide when he comes back. and we'll jump out. We've lost him. He stole my beacon. He just left. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> What's that? There it comes. There it comes back. Oh, you can see he's coming in. Okay, everybody on three, two. 
Surprise! Oh, okay. Yep, it went off. It went off. Thank you. So that's, I want to illustrate that a little bit to see kind of the distance, how, how, how often it updates. And this is direct from the, how the Apple's OS gives it back to the app. So you can't really get any faster than this when it's updating. So you can't really have, when you're updating a dot on a map or something like that, you couldn't update it within a few inches. Uh, but the thing to remember about beacons, it's a lot easier, it's a lot better than what we have with GPS. So even though you can't do like, if I move this over here and over here, it didn't track it, right? It's really not about tracking cups for magic tricks, right? It's more about being in proximity for something to do it, to know where it's at. All right, so let's, uh, we have a question? Yeah. Right, so the question was, can you get more accurate if you have more beacons? And so the app can get smarter about it because it can infer information. And if you know that you are, the beacons are 150 feet apart, and it, you can know very quickly if you've entered, a, if you've gone into range of one. So if you see that there's five beacons and you see three and two of them you don't, you know you're in that area, and then you can get some of this to kind of figure it out. So you gotta do, you gotta be smart about it, but also you gotta figure out how much, how granular do we, do you actually need? All right, so, um, Let's look at, uh, oh, so, some edge detection. So this is, this stopped working moments before I came in, so I'm gonna see if this will. So one of the interesting things is that iOS has the, uh, <laughs> see live tweets, commentary. Don't, now that you know that, don't tweet to make something <laughs> dirty if you're on the screen. <laughs> so I know how to turn it off. Um, so one of the, the key things is that you can do active ranging, but one of the other pieces is that you can do passive ranging or passive detection by putting the phone, even when the app is not running, um, it's not in the foreground, you can be notified in your app that you've come into range of one of these beacons. Okay, so the app will be on me, be woken up, launched in the background, and given, <coughs> given about 10 seconds to do something interesting. And if it's a background app, it can go longer than that. So uh, as you can see, as we knew he was coming back into the room, we could actually trigger it on something and do something interesting with that. So um, I will, uh, I'll use our GeoHopper app, and this is not an advertisement for it, even though it's awesome, you should download it right now. But um, it's uh, an app that allows you through geofencing and beacons to be able to, uh, to trigger on it. So I'll set up this brand new beacon. Any questions while this is reading settings? What's that? Oh, GeoHopper. GeoHopper. Yep. So can you use beacons to augment GPS? Can you use them for triangulation in a tight area? Like once you get the download from GPS? Um, hold on. We, we're having technical difficulties, so let me start this again. Uh, can you augment it? So everything goes to core location, and so you can't get specific GPS coordinates based on combining with these. And so what it's really meant to do is that you can use in conjunction with geofences to find out if you've entered the facility and that if you're near something interesting, you can do that. And you also know that if this is installed at the front desk, you no longer need to go to the, G, to the to find out what geolocation or anything like that because you know you're near the front desk. You're within 150 feet. You can show that on a map kind of thing. Any other questions? So yep. Using multiple beacons, is there a minimum distance to keep them? How far apart should you keep them so they can get the best reading? Oh, wow. Um, so the, the minimum distance is interesting. So I, I talked about one of the things I didn't mention was um, the, uh, I'll give it one more try while I'm talking. Um, the minimum distance. And so you, you saw the distance that they go. And a lot of times people think, oh, I want to be coverage large areas. But what you really want to do is call, you want to cover smaller areas that are kind of more focused, right? 
So that was the, one of the challenges we had here was being able to cover just the area of the reception or the check-in area or a room. And this actually, Dean's Hall 2 is next door, right? So you don't want to necessarily put a beacon on this side because it would cover through that area as well. So um, you want to try to pull in that, uh, that area to be just what you want to cover. But if you want to have un, because it's all spherical, mainly spherical, right, that it goes out. If you want to have multiple areas, like I want to extend it, like this half of the room and that half of the room kind of thing, I could put two beacons with the same identifiers, and the iOS would see that as one, one basically one area. In fact, I could say, I could put one in here with the one, same identifiers, and the one next door with the same identifiers, and it would see that as one big zone, right, whenever it entered. In fact, I could do it at my home in uh, Naperville, Illinois, and put one here, and the phone wouldn't know the difference between those two zones if the identifiers were the same. So it's, they, don't have to be, they don't have to be overlapping. So that's an interesting piece. If you put it into, like, you have gift shops in the, oh, no, um, it's at, the, at Penn State Stadium. They have all the different concessions areas, or maybe the help areas, right? You put a beacon each different one of the different help areas. Even though they may be way distance apart, as soon as you walk in any one of them, it says pop up a message saying, welcome to help, you know, press here to get emergency first aid or something like that. And they don't have to be next to each other. Does that answer your question? Now, look at this. What's that? One more time. Who wrote this software? That's what I want to know. Some joker. I think it's this Penn State battery. I think that's what the problem yeah. is. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I can do this. Hold on. This, this I will do. Oh. Oops. Yeah. Actually, I can feel this getting more slack as I plug this stuff in and out a lot. This is my own fault. All right, so the edge detecting I can't talk about, but I will try it at the end. And maybe it's just uh, the demo gods are not looking strong on me. Oh, no, they, that's one of the cool things. That it has an accelerometer. You shake it. They come back. All right, so let's, we have one, another fun thing that we can do is the ranging. So one of the things that we have is uh, I created this app that allows you to, on a map, be able to specify where, it doesn't detect where the beacon is, but if you can imagine this is a floor plan of where all the different conference rooms are. We have a beacon plugged in each one. It's, uh, it's right here is the one beacon. You can see as I walk away, oh, I thought I was tethered. Oh, I thought I was gonna pull something off the desk. You can see that it gets yellow when it's far away. It should go to red and then to green, right? When it gets closer. That's kind of neat. We already saw that. You're like, Tim, you're not showing us anything new. Stop repeating yourself. Let's plug in a few more beacons and find out what happens. I have fancy power supplies. Plug these in. I'll put one over here. We should see another see it pop up. Hey, you got two yellow. Is there a power plug over there? No, I'm going to throw it. It's more fun. <laughs> now, of course, this is a, I did not map out this room and plot this exactly on it. So using your imagination, imagine that middle one is actually over there and those two are here. So you can see that one's further away and uh, those are closer. How much? Oh, I got no space. Okay, that didn't work very well. Okay, oh no, this one I have, right? So as I got, I don't know, imagine this is a bus. My metaphors are wearing out at this point, but... You can see this one, this should go to red. So this goes exactly to the point you had before where can you tie out information. So using this information where, like, again, you have to imagine these aren't actually positioned where they're supposed to be on this map, but if I were in this imaginary room, where would I be? I'd be closer to the yellow than I was to the red ones, right? And so you can infer a lot of that information. Um, and it should go to green again. So you can get even closer if you want to go to be able to do a tap. So let's do that. Okay. Um, so now if we go, oh, I'm too close to already. So now, stop. So now if I 
if I go into that, uh, what color is that, green zone, right, it's right onto it. If I go and I tap on the beacon, it comes up and it says, do you want to share your contacts with FileMaker? It says, imaginary corporation. Imagine there's this magical corporation that makes databases that are easy to use. <laughs> it would be these guys. And I hit share, and then I can share my information with, with this person. So the idea is that um, if I go and I tap on, oh, I wish I could, I have no space. But if I went and tapped on one of those other beacons, it would come up with a different, a different vendor. Um, can I do that? I know what I can do. I can unplug this beacon. Yeah, I know, I know. It's magical. And I'll plug this one in. And I will tap on it. And Arrowhive Networks. It's another imaginary corporation I came up with. They, they make networking gear. And so I can do that. So you can just imagine, you can use beacons um, to be able to have really close proximity or have very you know, kind of general, you know, proximity where you're at. Question? So that's based, basing that on both proximity and this is that friendly accelerometer? This one is just solely based on beacon. But you can put accelerometer data in there. Right, right. So that's based off of this. Um, see where it says... Um, Immediate, so there's three zones. One is far, and then there's are near and immediate. So when it goes to immediate, it means you're tapping right on it. See, it went to immediate, and then I move it away. Move it away, away a little more, and it should turn into uh, near. So it's just based on it. And the, the cool thing about tapping is that it's pretty immediate. You can see that to go from near to far, it takes a little bit of time, but if I go from near to immediate, it's really fast, because it knows it's right next to it. And I know it's a lot of implementation detail, but we're going to need it when we start talking about how would you would architect some kind of solution for a university. Exactly. Get into that. That's the same thing that app is using with the Apple TV. Just a tap to configure in the newer one. Uh, I've read. <laughs> yeah, so it's one of my tasks to do is get one of my Bluetooth sniffers to find out if that's actually true. I've read a lot of stuff on blogs. And you can believe this, sometimes some of the stuff I read on blogs isn't true. So I don't actually do it myself. I know, I know, it's weird. Some kind of heretic that doesn't believe everything I read. But um, I think they're using some version of it to do that. I don't know if it's actually iBeacon or not. But I do know that when you pull up, um, the Apple TV looks very much like a beacon device when you pull up in our tools. So. Um, I think they're using part of that to be able to do it. All I know, too, is that my Apple TV doesn't support it because it's one of the newer Apple TVs, which means I've got to spend $99 to figure that out. All right, other questions? Yep. So, since it's using single strength to determine the recruiter proximity, is there a, like an agreed upon standard for transmission power for the various Bluetooth, uh, for the actual things themselves? Because like, you know, TI can send out a different, a different power level than. Right. So I, I actually, so, so Dave's question was, is there a agreed upon way to figure out the distance based on how, how strong the signal is? So Apple actually does that for you. These numbers here are uh, the accuracy numbers there. They're given directly in meters from Apple. Right? They're, you don't have to worry about that RSSI value. And so I lied to you a little bit when I said this, the beacon only sends out three things. UUID, I should ask. <laughs> what are the three things? <laughs> Oh, it's working now. My mom just entered home. But um, three things I said. What are the three things that a beacon sends out? You're not allowed to leave until you know the three things the beacon sends out. UUID. UUID. Okay. Tom gets a cracker. Um, there's a fourth one. The fourth one is a value that tells you what is the signal strength at one meter. So all beacon manufacturers have to put inside that packet that sends out at one meter. They measure this, how, how much at one meter what's the, the power strength. And from there, the APIs can figure out what 10 meters or 30 meters is. So the, the, the app itself just gets back meters. And of course, if the, the manufacturer does it wrong, everything will be whacked out, uh, which we found out the hard way. Everything's like crazy. What's that? Or if you have a lot of water bags. A lot of what? Bags of water. Uh, yes, right. So that means that if, if this is a one meter, but I put a bag of water in it, it thinks it's, it's more than one meter, so it'll think that it's farther away. So that's why it's, uh, yeah, stay away from bags of water or people. That's what I say. All right. 
Where were we? Um, oh, we did the tap already. Let me give, I mean, now that, now that my mom entered home, let me try. You guys know about my family now. My niece is having surgery. My mom just arrived home. Oh, she left? What is my mom doing leaving so early at night? <laughs> she does, she actually, she, she's like, oh, it's my son's app. I need to run it. It's great. But then she'll say, I get self-conscious when I leave my house. I forget something and come back because you'll get notified. And then you'll know that I forgot something. I'm like, I don't even notice. Yeah. Right, there is. So that's 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 not part of the spec, but you can you can scale back the power uh, to do that. Okay, I can I can answer that two ways. One is I can demo it, or I can do it in modern dance. Which which would you rather? <laughs> no, okay. Let's <laughs> let's. Um, I actually promised somebody I'd work modern dance into my talk, so I just. I just got to start for that, so thank you. Um, let's go back in and, uh, oh, the range of the power. So I'll turn the power all the way down on this guy. Oh, I unplugged it. Let's see if I can figure out which one it is. Uh, is that it? Was that it? Oh, I know what I can do. I will unplug all of these. Oh, unplug that one in the corner. Did you throw that one back to me yet or not? Did I have to just plug this one in? I plugged it in over there. What's that? So just unplug it. I got two on the table and maybe a third. All right, that's why it's good to have a labeler. Wow, there's a lot of beacons around. All right, so let's do this one. There's a good chance that's the one I want. That's not it. Let me try this one. I have a good feeling about this. Ah, there it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there it is. I knew it was there the whole time. It's out of range. Is that what? Did you unplug that one back there? Yeah. All right. Give me a second. That one went away, okay. I know somebody brought a Bluetooth jammer in here. You know I know where you are. We'll find you, okay. What's that? It's called Wi-Fi. Blame Penn State again, that's great. I can throw Penn State in, under the bus all day long. Uh, AT&T, okay. I could just answer the question, but I'd, I'd rather, much rather just stand up here and look like a fool. Yes, no, the, so these are all just BLE devices. We actually have a mode, ah, that's actually good, because then I can use my other password. So yeah, I have this in a mode where it shows everything. There we go, all right. I'm pretty sure that's the one in front of me. Let me save that. Now the power is at the very lowest state, and I'll go back on to allocate. So do I need to tell you the answer? You don't think he's doing the demo because he doesn't know the answer and he's just doing this? How if I whisper this way? No, you just trust me that I know the answer, and I'll tell you if I'm wrong. All right, here it is. It's not, it, yes, it is this one. Okay. This is the lowest power. We usually get 10 feet. There you go. There you go. There's your answer. Well, negative one meter. I mean, it's a negative, it's negative one eye, or one eye, sorry. So right about here. I was saying f six feet. That's, that's more than six feet, isn't it? One, two. <laughs> How many meters is it? Who said six? Six meters? This is, a, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six and a half meters. <laughs> so you can bring it down. You saw the distance that he went, had to go to to get rid of it. So it goes from, what I was telling people, 150 feet down to about 
six feet, it's more maybe a 10 feet kind of thing. Um, and so you can pull that, that range back in. The problem is that when you do that close a range, the immediate uh, near and far gets all compressed into that, and so it's hard to be able to range in between there is a lot harder when you get those condensed. But the triggering on the edges is easier to do. Does that give you, I assume that gives you an exponential decrease in signal strength and interference too? Well. Oh, uh, I don't, that I don't know, interference. Oh, I see what you mean, right. So, yeah, so I wouldn't interfere with somebody outside there. That's correct. That's a good point. Uh, question in the back. I can't hear it, sorry. Did it turn off? So you wouldn't have to worry about the immediate or far if you're on a low power setting, you're just only concerned about near the device. Right, so, so the question was, is do you really, if you're that, bringing in that close, you're not really concerned about ranging all that much? So that's true, right? If I'm doing passbook, which I'll show in a second, which you guys saw for the conference, all you care is about, do you see the beacon or you do not see the beacon? That you don't care then for the ranging stuff. You can go in this close. Like if we want to have it only when somebody walked up the reception desk, would it show it, but not if somebody walked by, or maybe not another side of the hall or something, we could do that. But you're right, if you're trying to range it between walking between two pictures at a gallery, it would be really, it would be, it would be hard to do, and then you put people in the mix, and it'd be even harder to do, right? Mike. That's correct. The immediate, near, and far are Apple's designations. Immediately, as soon as the developer sees that, they think, I'm going to make it more accurate because I'm going to look at this accuracy number and do it myself. And then they spend, I don't know, three or four weeks trying to figure that out and then give up and realize what Apple tells you is a good general guideline. And you can't get any, it's hard to get any more deterministic, right? You can get better values if it's clean, but life's never clean kind of thing. So yes, that's, those are given to you as by Apple as kind of general guidelines, and it usually works better to do that. Kristen? <laughs> right, so the question was, does reducing uh, the power output increase the battery life? And I thought yes a lot, and we did testing, as well as the, the hardware guy, the answer is pretty much it's almost, uh, it's, it gives you very little difference. It's when you turn the antennas on or you turn them off. How far you broadcast, does matter a little bit for Frau, but when you turn them on, that's where all your energy comes from to do that. So I thought it would be if you brought it down to you know, 10% or whatever, you'd be saving a huge amount of battery life would double, you're only getting like a 10% increase or something like that. It makes very little difference. It's how often you broadcast, like you turn the antennas on, but Apple specifies you have to do it 10 times a second. So you're not really, if you want to be in spec, you have to do that. So you have very little control over battery life. Yep. Uh, oh, did it only go, now I could get, so this is, so if I put it right here next to it, that's immediate, that's near, is that what you're asking? No, I'm asking if you can shut it down to, I don't know what his question is, if you, can you shut it down just to where you're like tapping it? No, this is, for, for the beacons that we make, there is a way that I'm sure other ones can, you can bring in the power even closer to be able to do it. If you want to do the tap, what you're looking for is not bringing the power down, but looking to see if it goes into that near mode. And that's kind of what the range is. But you've got to have the app in the front. And, but that's normally when you're paying. That's what you would do um, most of the time. Yep. Have you guys tested at all using like uh, USB extension cable so you could put the power brick actually without worrying about battery, put it into power? Right, so this all, so the question was, do you, could you use a USB extension cable to be able to put it, to more tune it to your environment and those kind of things? Definitely. There's battery powered ones as well. You can be able to do that. Um, and these, if it's USB, you can plug it into, I don't know, there's lots of USB. My Mini Cooper has two USB ports. But they turn off, they turn off with the car, which kind of sucks. So my car's not beacon enabled when it's off. I got a new follower. Hey, look at that. Um, all right, so let me go on the next thing. Let's talk a little bit about uh, beacon-enabled passes. And I'm giving away a $20 uh, gift certificate to Starbucks as a contest to see who can decode a push notification from a pass the fastest. So 
Trust me, that doesn't sound fun, but it's a lot of fun. Okay, so I want you to open up your phones and go to this URL. It's complicated. It's bit.ly slash PSU Mac. You should get a pass. Something went wrong? Yeah, mine loaded. Yeah, demo test one, two, three. That's, uh, it's, uh, that's not the encrypted name. That's just something I came up with. So if you didn't want to install that pass, um, it should be beacon enabled for this beacon. I've already added it. It might actually not be this beacon. It could be this beacon or that beacon. Let me find out. I told myself last night I was going to label these beacons, but then I thought, you know what, I'll just, I'll just keep track of them. That worked out pretty well. <laughs> I bet it's the one over in the corner. So, oh, there, we got it. One of the three I just plugged in. Now I'm going to unplug them. So one of the things about uh, passes is that you can, passes are just XML files. I think they're technically plist files. No, they're zips with like a, a JSON inside of it. So it's, it's a very kind of simple uh, type of thing. Is it still showing up? Hey, my mom went back home. Hi, mom. <laughs> Just for the record, she opted in to give me those. I'm not tracking my mother. <laughs> well, I am, but. <laughs> She, she chose the name home, too, so she could actually, home could mean, I don't know, the grocery store, and I wouldn't know. Could be undisclosed location. Okay, I found the beacon, and I'll remember it's this black one with the, the USB dongle on it. No, I'll never forget. Um, so now if you, if, you, if you lock your phone and then you unlock it, iOS will scan for any Bluetooth devices, any iBeacon devices that have been registered with a specific UUID major minor number. And so this one has it. Who has it? Raise your hand if you see that on your lock screen. Okay, how many people want to see it but don't see it? Oh, pretty good. I'll walk closer. Just unlock and lock your phone a lot. What's that? Wi Fi, just Bluetooth. Do you see it? Mine says the infinite is unknown. The infinite is unknown. How many people are familiar with Zombocom? Nobody? Oh, okay, we got Tom. All right. Sorry, Justin or Dave are mad at me now. Uh, can they still hear me on the tape? Don't I was like, don't. All right. <laughs> um, again, that's great. I have no idea. We're talking about passes. I walked over there, and now we're saying, oh, so these are beacon-enabled passes. They have, they have. Um, uh, a UUID and a major minor number inside these passes. What you got when that you were that fancy bit.ly URL actually pointed to S3, just cloud storage. So just downloaded the pass file. There's no server involved. It was just a static pass file. It has my name on it. You probably wouldn't want to just send out a pass with my name on it to everybody. You'd probably put something more generic. But it's just a, it's just a zipped up document that has some JSON in it that you can just edit, make these passes available. But inside that payload is a UUID major minor number and it makes it appear on your lock screen, which is kind of neat. Okay. Um, and so if you go away from, if I unplug this beacon, you can see that if you, um, it'll eventually, it'll, when your phone goes to sleep and then you wake it up, you'll see that that goes away. There we go. See, it goes away. So it's a great way to notify people of it. And when you plug it back in, it comes back, and you can go right into it. So now if I slide it on the lock screen, I have access to the pass right there. And I can flip it over, and as you know from the PSU conference, the links aren't live, right? Not that there's any links on the back, but you have to go into Passbook. So one of the nice things about that is, um, so passes can, is a great way to test out proximity enabled with beacons without having to develop an app and put it on there. Because the beacon itself doesn't have any content, and the phone doesn't recognize any beacons unless you have an app or a pass. 
So the easiest way is just to create a pass and um, set it up in your cube, set it up in, uh, in your meeting room. So next time you guys have a meeting, you send out a pass to people, they come and it lights up the pass. Then everyone comes up with 15 different ideas of beacons, and you try to figure out how to best choose which ones you're going to do, kind of thing. So um, now, and another nice thing is what we did with this conference is now that you've installed passes, I can send a push notification to your phones. So I have a direct conduit to your electronic device, which is something I've, that's what this whole session is about. And I'm going to send a push notification with uh, something you'll have to decode for $20 for a Starbucks gift card. Um, this has nothing to do with proximity, it's just because I can. Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you get a push notification. Did you get one? All right. It also appears in the back of your pass if you want to look at it. Um, you might have to pull down a refresh, but it's more exciting if you get a push notification. You got it? All right. So decode that. It's a challenge. Oh my gosh, no, no, no. I did it, yay, I didn't wait too long. Um, all right. So next, let's talk a little bit about, or let me give you a couple minutes to decode that. I guess we get something. Oh no, I'm sorry. Once you decode it, you have to tweet it because it contains a hashtag. Once you have the hashtag, the whole world will know that you won $30 and you'll be everyone's best friend, or at least six people, because you can buy them a, six people a $5 cup of coffee. Done? All right, I'm looking at the tweets. Nothing. Okay, you got it. Did you do it? Is it up there? Oh, no. Wait, okay, let's, let's do it the dramatic way. Drum roll, please. I'll go to TweetBot and PSU Mac. All right, who's the first one? Is it Mike? All right, very nice base 64 decoding, Mike Boylan. Please stop by our booth and we'll give you a $20 gift certificate for that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about now. So those are all the pieces, right? So now the interesting piece, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, I'll turn off my Twitter feed. Um, Applying this to education. So we've, we've worked with some customers. We haven't any large-scale deployments in education yet, but the big interests have been around campus tours, right? If you can imagine going and not just, I mean, I've seen campus tours. I've, I've, we've been assessing a lot of these campus tours, and the way they're doing them right now, I see you guys can probably, does anybody have a good campus tour they want to talk about? Anyone have a terrible campus tour they want to talk about? How do you navigate it? Right. All right. See, and you have a set time that you have to do it, and you have to meet at that time and schedule an appointment to be able to do it. Right. The hot, oh, all year, not just the summer when it's really hot. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> With a sign like this. All right, come this way. This is the party fraternity. You guys should rush. Um, anybody have any walking tours that do anything electronic? It uses assisted technology. What do you guys do? So what do they what do they look the video on? Is it in a screen that's on there? Oh, so they, they have their their badge kind of activates it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so imagine if you take beacons and uh, well, well the, the, some of the other tours that I've seen is uh, based on QR codes, right? You have an app and you go and you scan the QR code and then something comes up in the device. 
And the other this one was like the, the hilarious one to me. We said they have a phone number you call, and when you go up to the exhibit, you would pipe, type in the, the number. So it's like checking voicemail the whole time you're walking through this tour and putting your phone up to your ear to listen to it. Just like, talk about not being involved in the tour and just like totally interoperating with your technology kind of thing the whole time. Even worse is like technology from the 70s where it's like voicemail. Well, I don't know, when was voicemail? 80s? Answering machines? Answering machines were 80s, maybe 90s. Anyways. Um, so what I really want, what I want my walking tour to be, and I think this is the way that kind of everything is going to be going, is that it's going to be no interface whatsoever, right? You put on your headphones, you put on your earbuds, and you walk around, and it knows when you're in proximity. So I walk, and I'm in front of a historic building, uh, at, I'm in front of the, the stadium, and it talks about, you know, the, the cr rush of the crowd and all the different things that happened, and it talks about um, the things that happened around in that area because a beacon's enabled in that area. And one of the things that one of... Uh, one of, the, one of our folks was talking about was being able to give more information if somebody stays longer, right? So it's not just about you're in this area, but how long are you in this area? Because if you go and you stand there for a long time, it might mean that you're more interested. It can start giving you more information about it. And then it can augment with media on your app and that kind of stuff, links and multimedia and that kind of stuff. But for me, the walking tour, it would be great to be able to walk around and not have to even like worry about the technology and it kind of goes away until you're at the, actually a spot that you want. And it also leads to discovery. You don't even have to follow, you know, the, when I went to Michigan State, in the library they have lines on the ground. They'd say, follow the red line to the blue line to the green line to find where your book section is. You would just wander around and it would be able to find out where you're at. So that's an interesting way for campus tours to be able to do it. Um, we've had a bunch of uh, requests about uh, galleries, right? Museums and galleries inside campus uh, 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 on campus, right, to be able to look at that content. So the beacons are really focused about if you're in that area to give that content. And some of the, um, the demos that we've worked up have been about HTML content or in a native app that you can update the content from the gallery's website that'll be presented to the user when they're in front of a painting, if they're in front of the, um, uh, in front of the uh, piece of work. Piece of work. Um, one of the other things we have a high school working on that's interesting that uh, they wanted to go, uh, no, it's actually a junior college. When they wanted to walk in for the first day, they would be able to walk in. The classroom would be beacon enabled. Most of the time, the first day in the first class, it's about half the class is spent just getting syllabuses out to people, figuring out people are supposed to be in that right room, right? Who's there? What class is it? And if you can imagine, you beacon enable it, you walk in, that it knows that you're in, you know, Psych 101, here's the syllabus, right? This person's checked into this class. You kind of remove all those pieces to it, and they kind of know where they are, and be able to kind of be able to get that push information instead of answering the same questions over and over. That's another one we've seen. Um, uh, promotions at sporting events, we actually see that in some large stadiums, but I guess I was thinking about that in terms of uh, when we went to, the, to have uh, corn last night at the, uh, what's the name of the stadium? Uh, Beaver. Beaver Stadium. Uh, fundraisers, and then oh, one of the things I thought that was interesting was emergency meetup points, right? Because one of the things you want to find out is people, how fast you get up there and be able to check in with beacons, right? And we've had this with meetups. We're making some apps for when people are all in one area. But we had one college that was talking to us about um, being able to, like when there's a fire drill or emergency, when you have those meetup points, be able to have people check in very quickly. And the other thing is, the problem is that people will go to the wrong side of the building. Right? They're supposed to go to meet at point A and they'll go to meet at point B and those two people can't talk. And if they do have to talk, they won't have time to do it. So you're missing a person for a long time. If they just check in automatically to a beacon point based on an app, they wouldn't, we can, could make that go faster. So that's kind of the ones that we've been talking about. Anybody have any, any questions or any ideas you have for it? Okay, good point. Uh, so the question was about Android or Windows. So this is, um, the story around that is right now, it's, it's not all that great right now, but I believe it's gonna be changing soon, and I'll give you the premise for that right now. The, the, the only thing that's Apple proprietary about iBeacon is the name. Apple is, has trademarked the name iBeacon, but anybody can create an iBeacon and put in, have it broadcast, or create a, take a Bluetooth 
smart device and have it broadcast the same signal, and it's not Apple can't demand a fee, they can't, there's no licensing associated with that. It's only if they do the iBeacon moniker. So that's good for it to be able to have this ecosystem be able to be wider than just iOS. Android has a problem right now with the number of devices out there that have Bluetooth smart. So the, the Amazon Fire Phone that was just announced, that has Bluetooth 3.0. And that's kind of uncommon for a new device to have that. So most new Android devices, what's that? Why? 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 I know. I know. It's like why? Maybe you keep the cost down. There's a nickel they want to save on that. I'm not sure. Um, but most, any, any of the new Windows phones, any of the higher end or even the medium end Android phones have it now. Android itself only supported Bluetooth LE as in KitKat, I believe. So it's only been built into the, old, into the OS. And Android has an issue where people usually upgrade based on their hardware instead of loading the new operating system. So the story is good, right? It means that Android is supporting Bluetooth. The newer phones have it. We just have to wait a little bit, right? It's not one of those things like it's harder to support that number of screens or it's fragmented. It's really about waiting for people to get on KitKat and be out on more modern phones. And by more modern, we're just, it's not, I mean, it's only, Bluetooth Smart has been around for a couple of years, and uh, the hardware, since the OS didn't support it, there wasn't a lot of push for the hardware to support it either. Samsung had some of their own proprietary support, but now that Google introduced actual BLE support, it's gonna get better. So there's a, that's the larger answer to your question. The smaller one is that if you have a handset that supports Bluetooth Smart and you're running KitKat, can you do beacon detection? And the answer is yes. There's open source frameworks that allow you to do it. It's kind of roll it your own at this point, but I really expect it to get stronger going forward based on you got to have the hardware and the OS support to be able to do that. Windows Phone, since there's a limited, more, the more limited number of hardware, um, it, it already, I mean, it's the Nokia phone and it's just the one or two Nokia phones, right? So it has Bluetooth Smart in it and Microsoft has some support for, it has support for BLE. It just doesn't have any specific iBeacon support in it, but that would just be an OS update. So I think as Apple gets traction with iBeacon and more people adopt it, the other ones are going to do it. We've already seen that Windows Phone 8.1 supports the Passbook format. It doesn't support Beacon part of Passbook, but it does support Passbook. So we're seeing more of that adopting technologies that are getting traction in the, in the uh, getting a widespread adoption. Does that answer your question? Yep. Um, when you talk about like the, the large crowd implementations of, of iBeacon, some of the yep. Is there any way to increase the surface area of the tappable? I mean, does it does literally a beacon have to be like every five inches? Um, to make it so like you could have a bar that's tappable instead of just like. So that's you can you can either key off of the immediate near and far, or you can actually look at the accuracy. And the thing about when you're tapping. There's nothing ever going to be in between you and where you're tapping. So you can have, you know, those numbers get really accurate at really close range. So yes, you can spread it out, right? So if it's, uh, it's, if it's near this beacon and you know this area was in, you know, half a meter, nothing's really going to get in the, that ranging is going to be really easy. So the answer is yes to that. You could, you could get that. Yes. Yep. Or just have, you can have five beacons. We sell beacons. If you want to buy five, we'll sell you five. But yeah, there's no reason the technology wouldn't be able to do that. Yes. In our examples, the uh, little itty bitty beacons uh, stay put and the mobile devices move around and discover them. Have anyone imagined uh, situations where the, the beacons would be on the move? Okay, so the question was, is there uh, a deployment scenario where the beacons themselves move and maybe the phones stay stationary, maybe they're moving as well? They're both on the move. Right, maybe both on the move. anybody has thought on that move. So I've heard people doing I hate this word. I hate this word because I can't pronounce it. Ideation, 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 on it and putting it on buses. So you imagine when a bus arrives. That's actually one of the when Apple introduced Beacon technology in WWC 13. They talked about a bus arriving, and you would know if it's the express bus or not the express bus by standing up there. So the Beacon would be itself would be moving. One of the ideas people are thinking about is taking making every iOS device a Beacon itself, and then we could do this kind of peer-to-peer -peer proximity, know where people are at. Um, that gets difficult because Apple doesn't allow becoming a beacon in the background. So you both have to have the app running in the foreground. And they did that mainly out of battery concerns. And having these walking around um, on like badges and those kind of things. I've seen there's app developers that are doing stuff like that. I don't know how much. You're limited by the, 
you know, people being in front of you and fi- trying to arrange to find how close they are. Um, but I think there's going to be solutions around it. For me, it's it's because when I place a beacon, I know that if I get signal, I know where that's located. So I know I'm close to that. If it's moving around, that's that's a harder target to do. So, what's that? Field trip chaperones. Oh, you mean like if the kid runs away, you get notified? Yeah. Well, that's and if they get outside of your, you know, yep. 10 meters, whatever. There's a startup called Tracker. I mentioned this in another session. I have the pieces. They're oh, okay. big, they're button batteries. You can stick them on anything. And the app, anybody who's running the app, so if the device like leaves your possession, and somebody else who has the app on their phone. Isn't that tile? Or is that? Tile. Is it tile? Tracker. Oh, okay. No, a couple of different ones. I don't know if it's iBeacon, but similar technology with Bluetooth. There's a lot of like people that want to do stuff with beacons that would be better with just Bluetooth low energy. Um, maybe that's not an example that does that, but you can. They're very much about proximity and sensors. Um, the bi- beacon stuff makes it easier. You had a question? You forgot your question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Yep. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of manufacturers that make them. A lot are battery-powered ones that run off the coin cell batteries. Um, there's a couple of the ones that are, bat- that are USB-powered as well. And what's the price point? Uh, so the price point on the beacons run just from what the market I mean, Some of the ones are, it ties into their service, so it's hard to, hard to know what the beacons themselves cost. But really, the hardware we're seeing is something from like $25 up to... $33 per. Some of them you have to buy three at a time, that kind of stuff. Prices go down based on quantity as well. Um, so uh, it's a lot of, I mean, the major players, there's Estimote, Qualcomm has one, uh, Two Canoes has the USB beacon, and then there's a couple other smaller ones. Well, some in Europe as well that don't. It's hard to ship this stuff over the seas and still be cost competitive for $20. Yep. Yeah so, yeah, so the question was, do you see a lot of businesses? And that's, we're seeing that traction right now. That's where the big kind of movement is right now. The, the first movers on this was the marketing people wanted to push coupons to people's phones. And he, we had to kind of beat them back with a stick saying, one, that you can't do that. And two, if you could, everyone would uninstall your app. So it wouldn't matter either way. And they're like, well, we still want to throw money down that hole. And they're like, no, it's not. Go ahead, but it's not going to help you. But it's more about navigation in an app, being able to know, to building that relationship, right? My... I think the premium experience right now for a mobile app is Starbucks, where you go in with, they have very good integration with their checkout, their loyalty, and, uh, and, and the kind of the, the whole payment system. They have geofencing now. I expect that to go to iBeacon. They haven't done it yet. But being able to walk up and automatically have that payment card to show it to them, push your free drinks down to your phone, be able to know that in a way that you can be trusting that, that you have that trust between you and relationship. That's, for me, what I, I love about the way the kind of computing is gone, it's, I feel like you can't, if you put crapware on my phone, I know where it is and I can delete it really easily. You can't sneak stuff on there. And so it's that, you have to build that trust. Once I, if I install an app, it means that I like your company a lot. I don't install an app if I don't. Yep. Right, very true. That, so Mike's point was that you can't just send stuff to your phone. You have to get something, you have to have a pass or an app. And the question is, how do you get there? And the reason I'm excited about the pass is, even though the technology is kind of limiting for the scope of what it does, you can put a QR code up, scan with Passbook, the Passbook app, and then on the back of the pass have a link to the app. And in iOS 8, Apple's putting the um, uh, discovering app on the lock screen. That I don't believe it's I don't believe it's um, beacon enabled. I think it's more about apps near me is what they're doing. I don't know for sure. It's, uh, it's GPS. Oh, it's GPS. Okay. And they, you can do an but it's, it's, it's oh, okay. That I know. They didn't they didn't talk about it at WBC. But that's uh, so that's gonna be a, that's a big point. You got to get the stuff on it before you can actually see these devices. I'm out of time now. So I'll be up here if you want to come talk to me, or I'm in the vendor area. Thanks very much.